the members of the platform is Professor Denis Kelly on ultrasound, Professor André Favin, Professor Ursula Keller, Professor Meyer, and Professor Grisman. My name is Heinrich Meyer. I'm uh, the uh, member of the board of the Scientific Advisory Board, like Andrea Cuomo. And I've taken the role today. It's my pleasure to uh, chair this panel. We have the usual forum. Five minutes, please. And I'll just stand up as all the other the previous speakers and uh, let you know that your five minutes are over. Uh, we have to take all the questions together at the end. And uh, I'll be happy to have the audience very much involved because I don't want to. I might have the first question, but then I hope the audience will have the rest of the questions. Thank you. So, good afternoon. I'm going to talk about the Ultrasound to Go. This is a collaboration done with uh, colleagues like Luca Benini, Gian Stephen Muri, Joseph Sifarakis, Lothar Artilla, and Jean Philippe Tiran. Basically, from the Perifel, the Zurich, and the Schuf, that's the hospital in the camp. So, the motivation of this work is that ultrasound imaging is a common and invasive medical technique. It's more and more widely used. It's in place. There are many manufacturers. Typically, the apparatus is large, or at least for me, large is something big like this podium, which is something that it's not easy to be transported, for example, in an ambulance, or not easy to have at home. There are some portable systems, as you can see on the right, there are some systems done by GE and other manufacturers that are portable, but uh, the main limitation is not the limited power of the small device, but it's the fact that the ultrasound operation requires a specialist, requires a sonologist, who would put the probe in a specific position in order to see the right image. If the probe is not well used, the image does not make sense to anybody. And then also portable systems have limited uh, processing capability. Systems are closed systems, that is, the software is proprietary, it's not possible to develop apps and build on top of existing systems. So the objectives of this uh, task is to uh, build a medical imaging device that has the capability of large, non-mobile uh, uh, systems, and also enable the 3D imaging. By building 3D images and models of this, it is possible to capture images, possibly transmit them through med uh, telemedicine, and then having the sonologist on the receiving end, because it's possible to rotate the image and therefore understand the feature that the doctor is looking for. From an engineering standpoint, what we want to build is a parable, scalable ultrasound system that can be used at mobile points of care and also leverage programmable hardware in parable computation. This is a multi-scale system engineering because it's an engineering that bridges the gap among sensing, processing and visualization using a limited set of resources. So what are the gun challenges? Why is this science? Well, one issue is to be able to achieve energy scalable processing, storage, and on-chip communication. This is extremely important to achieve portability and to achieve a form factor so that the device can be used. And at the same time, what we want to do is to achieve probably correct algorithmic and software implementation. So being able to put in place way of verifying the algorithms, way of uh, constructing the software so it's fully correct so that the system can be safe. Now, a way of visualizing our work is starting from ultrasound application that can be seen as a flow of MATLAB functions and mapping them onto parallel architectures that now we see them as using FPGA-based systems. So what are the important uh, tasks and challenges that we will have? One is to be able to provide a safe and efficient flow that maps the abstract computational flow into programmable hardware and FGAs, and possibly later on on a mini core ASIC processor if this becomes available from us to us. At the same time, being able to identify what are the computational kernels that would benefit from specific accelerator, therefore motivate the design of specific 
ASIC sub-functions that would implement the function in hardware and therefore speed up the computation, and also investigate the memory bandwidth limitation. Remember that this type of task, especially on high-resolution 3D ultrasound, is extremely consuming in terms of bandwidth, especially when you go from the probe to the computing system. So there's lots of data that needs to be transported. Finally, we want to develop also an interface computational engine that provides links to two sides of the equation. On one side, the physics, the probe itself, and the highly demanding analog circuitry that you need to have on the front end, and on the opposite hand, how to be able to use a display engine, which eventually could also be a low-cost tablet connected to a portable device. And, of course, along the way, there are many numerical analysis environments that need to be studied and need to be tuned in order to make this successful. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me present you now the project Body Powered Sense. Uh, body Powered <laughs> Sense stands for Body Powered Sensors by Scavenging Energy. That means we will talk about scavenging energy also, but also from the Terra part. And you can see that people involved in the project are also uh, physicians, that means uh, Dr. Maria Knyazeva from Laboratoire de Recherche en Neuroimagerie from the CHUV in Lausanne, Gabi Volrab from the Kinderspital, Child Children Hospital in Zurich, and uh, for the physician, and we have a lot of uh, scientific people coming or uh, technicians uh, coming from either ETH Zurich, that means uh, Professor Gutknecht from Native System Group in Zurich, Professor Thomas Gross from Laboratory of uh, Software Technology, Professor Christopher Yerold, Micro Nano Systems Group, and also in ETH Zurich. And finally, for EPFL, uh, David, uh, Professor Atienza from Embedded System Laboratory. Uh, Danny Brion from Sensor Actuators Microsystem Laboratory and uh, SPI, I am representing his Electronics and Signal Processing Laboratory. Okay, what are the project challenges for body powered sense? We would like to improve the healthcare through some smart, convenient, and wearable uh, sensors. That means we would like to use advanced human energy harvesting towards a fit and forget the, the sensor, the, the energy harvesting system, without no, uh, with no recharge goal. It's uh, towards this goal. And the target energy optimization and usage are part of all the laboratories for both uh, EPFL and ETH Zurich. That means we would like to optimize the power consumption from the energy harvesting sources to the storage. That means it's, uh, it's made by uh, Professor Yerold, by uh, Danny Briand, and by our laboratory for uh, power management. We have also the ultra low power energy ASICs fabrication for microcontrollers in its charge of from uh, embedded system laboratory in Lausanne. And finally, we have also to optimize all the firmware for our application to, in order to maximize all the results and uh, the, the results divided by energy, the, the, this ratio, which is quite important, in its charge from the laboratories at ETH Zurich from the Terra part. We would like to apply this technology for real and demanding clinical use, and it's a Kinderspital and the shoes that has ensuring the fitness for the purpose, and the two applications chosen are epilepsy for children, and it's charge of Kinderspital in Zurich, and Alzheimer disease for the elderly people in the shoe. It's a shoe. And finally, we involve also two industries, that means 
by Element and Exploris, and also a collaboration with uh, uh, internal medicine uh, people, Dr. Markus Fritsch, in multidisciplinary IT research. What is the idea? To have wearables. Wearable, wearables. We would like for epilepsy and for Alzheimer to have electroencephalogram baseball cap for the brain sensing of the, the, the sensor. And we would like to obtain only 24 electrodes and with a sample rates of 500 to 1,000 sample rates. And the energy there will be used as either solar, and both solar and thermal, uh, thermoelectric generators. And the role, and, uh, the role is to intelligent record and compress the data, what you think by the EEG cap. The power budget is roughly 3 milliwatts. The ECG chest band, it's for, in order to access the sensing, it's only three electrodes. And in this case, uh, we would like to compute the earth rate, of course, and to compare the data together with the EEG. And in this case, the power budget is up to one milliwatt. And finally, we have a patient environment monitor, which is on the the wrist, huh? uh, and it's a context sensing, and it's used because for young children or for elderly people with Alzheimer's, it's not convenient to, uh, to manipulate the data, it's quite uh, random, the reaction of these uh, people, and that's the reason why the physician would like to have a patient or environment monitor, something like a watch. And here is the power, power for every system, which is shown. For the solar, we may obtain roughly 10 milliwatts per square centimeter. For the ther thermoelectric generator, only 20 microwatts per square centimeter. And for the piezokinetic system, only 4 microwatts per centimeter. But we would like to use the three kinds of energy in order to do the energy scavenging system. And last slide, the processing system which I used, we will have a sensor platform which will perform both physiological computation as well as energy hour decision to maximize the utility of the research and it will be by native system group. The firmware will be executed on a lower ASIC and it's done by an embedded system laboratory, this, uh, this ASIC. The home PC is a tech apart. Uh, it's a user-friendly interface made by an external company, which will allow us gathering and sending the data to a processor farm where the clinician will use it as Kinderspital and uh, LRN. And the user needs and usability drive the overall design, it's by element. And you have here the figure of the whole uh, data flow of the data. And clinical dimensions are made for Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy in children. Evolution will be made. And the functional, for example, as an example that the uh, physician is also to use, to, to, to develop new algorithms in order to shrink the, uh, the complexity of the system, is to use in the functional connectivity method to use low density EEG and not high density EEG. And there are a lot of work there in order not to lose the information by this operation. Thank you for your attention. second phase and we co uh, consolidated our efforts to the most winning 
piece of device from our first phase, and that's actually an optically pumped semiconductor laser, which most traditional engineering people think what a dumb idea. Now I would like to convince you that this is not so dumb, because the competition is not the semiconductor laser, but actually initially the diet pumped solid state laser has actually a very high margin on the market. So it's not in the communication sphere. You actually can earn money on the, there. So it's a collaboration between ETH Zurich and my group, then Thomas Südmeier at the University of Neuchâtel, Gabor, and then the application people, uh, Light Microscopy and Screening Center with Gabor Sisk, Morel from the METAS, and they're on mass from AB, uh, ABB Switzerland. So just again that you understand the terminology, um, it's basically the Mixel 2, it's, it's about the high power ultra fast semiconductor laser and to demonstrate their initial use in some commercial application. At this point we are focusing on frequency metrology, white light generation, and biomedical imaging, but we keep our eyes open for anything that pops up. So initially we started off with um, the CSM mode locked vexels, optically pumped vexels, which is very similar in the configuration, like dial pump solid state laser, you have a gain element and the additional absorber element, but then when we move into a semiconductor gain element, then we can actually integrate everything in one wafer, and the whole thing becomes much more simple, something that you cannot so easily do with a dial pump solid state lasers. When you look at our consortium, I mean, the, there is still a strong part is the device um, demonstration, and it's our goal to actually produce prototypes that then we make available to all our users. And to just show you the dynamics of our industrial partners, Oclara has been replaced by 2.6, which I think is a good move. Time bandwidth just has been acquired by JDSU Uniface, so we brought this company into Switzerland. So I think we have even more power now to move this forward. So when you look at parameter space we're going to address with this type of devices, we are going from 1 to 100 gigahertz, pulse repetition rates, we want to get over a watt of average power, there is no competing technology from a signal device laser out there. So we're competing uh, against dial pump solid state lasers. There are applications, I mean, a lot of uh, current telecom uh, and so on is still done with CW lasers or direct modulation, but we all know that this, there is an end to that and we need a new technology. We first focus on the multi-photon imaging, I mean, the, uh, basically the bio uh, application and the frequency com, and for this we have to actually push, push the device into the femtosecond operation, which is not totally uh, trivial, I mean, uh, when we started Mixel 2, we haven't done it yet with any Mixel devices. Um, the good news is we meanwhile have done it. So the first Mixel has been demonstrated with sub picosecond pulses at 5 gigahertz and more than 100 milliwatt of average output power. We know why the power is limited, uh, because uh, of the heat sinking. And then we also demonstrated the noise properties of this Mixel for the first time and could really show that the noise is on a level like the dial pump solid state laser. Actually something that a lot of semiconductor people still have a hard time to swallow and there are still people believing that this is not possible. It is possible. It works. And so this will make the frequency calm metrology application and actually coherent communication possible. Then. We also, just for the fun of it, because now we have such a simple device, you know, you have the gain chip and then you can just change the cavity length to the output coupler from 1.5 millimeter to 30 millimeter and you can continuously tune the repetition rate basically between 5 gigahertz to over 100 gigahertz and that shows you the performance level. I mean, in the lower uh, pulse repetition rate regime, we, we demonstrated more than a watt of average output power with picosecond pulses and we pushed it all the way to over 100 gigahertz with femtosecond pulses. So if you can do that, you know, you know you have something in your hands here. 
And so we just keep plugging away. And actually, some of the applications that we're also looking at, it, at the way it looks right now is that actually the gaming industry might even come sooner than the bio industry for this type of lasers. So thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon. I will talk about uh, PATLICI, which means it's uh, Polvorate Technology for Life Science, or uh, also have a work in the title Rapid Sensing of Cancer. So it's really a team very of, uh, interdisciplinary nature. So we have people from physics, from biology, from uh, engineering, and also uh, three groups actually from hospital. And also, um, uh, we have an industrial partner. Also. Uh, so the idea here is uh, actually something most of you know. If you go to a doctor, uh, so he normally, or if he wants to uh, examine you, he touches you, he feels your body, uh, maybe measures the pulse, or sees where you have your pain. And so this is actually quite an interesting technique uh, on a macrometer scale. It's of course very established for medicine, but uh, actually the idea of this project is to uh, transfer this to the nanometer scale. So instead of using your finger, you use a very fine needle of a force microscope and basically measure the mechanical properties of the cells of the, of the tissue and uh, get some information about the structure and uh, finally also, as you will see, uh, about uh, uh, disease. So in th this project, we actually focus on, on cancer. So here is an example of a, of a, a biopsy from uh, breast cancer. And so what you basically do is uh, you select a number of areas here, so typically eight areas, and on each of these areas, you have to do a lot of force curves, so you basically really touch the way you do it with the hand, and you feel how soft it is, so you measure the stiffness. And out of that, you get a map, so it looks like an image, but it gives you the information about the stiffness. And out of this, you basically uh, can uh, get some more, uh, you deduce the histogram. So this histogram is basically uh, then the characteristic uh, for, for, for us. So as you can see, you see here several peaks with different stiffnesses here. So uh, we will see that this is already telling you a lot. And uh, so this uh, would be uh, an example for a healthy person. Uh, so it's more or less one peak. Uh, and if you do the same with uh, cancer patients, you can see that you get uh, a small, very narrow soft peak here and you get some additional two peaks, also one at uh, actually higher stiffness. And this is actually uh, the characteristic. It really tells you uh, about even uh, the aggressiveness of this cancer. And uh, so that's uh, in principle a technique which has been now uh, uh, quite far developed. Uh, but uh, there is one disadvantage here. So this whole, whole procedure takes time. So it takes about three hours to measure that with one single probe. So the idea is actually to do that quicker. So that's uh, just done in a way that we use uh, a parallel approach. So we use arrays as shown here. So they're microfabricated group of uh, microderoi. And uh, we will then use uh, this uh, parallel approach to, uh, to measure these elastic properties. And by that we can reduce uh, the acquisition time hopefully to the range of minutes. This gives you really a, a big advantage. So we, there are two, actually two advantages. The first advantage is uh, largely atomized. So you don't need the doctor who to interpret the histology sample, but it, in principle it should be possible to get really a histogram and tell uh, if it's a cancer or not, or if it's benign. And the other thing is, of course, if you can do it quicker here, then we have also the advantage that uh, eventually we can do that in parallel to a surgery and get a quick answer. Finally, uh, we also uh, uh, use the same setup actually uh, to, to look for some biomarker tests. That's something which is in histology also 
used. They use different stains to look for the type of cancer. So it's sometimes quite important, for example, to know if you, oops, sorry, uh, I moved too far, if you have the HER2 gene. Uh, so this type of cancer, and if you can tell that, uh, it, you can also decide on the therapy. So we, we plan that basically we use the same mechanical setup, uh, functionalize the cantilevers here with antigene or DNA fragments, and can get, learn more, not even decide if there is cancer, but also about to learn about the type of cancer. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Christoph Barmet. I'm giving this talk on behalf of uh, Professor Klaus Prismann from the Institute for Biomedical Engineering of University and ETH Zurich. So this project is called Wearable Magnetic Resonance Imaging Detector and Sensor Array. This is a joint venture between three teams. It's the Institute for Biomedical Engineering and the Institute for Integrated Systems uh, of ETH Zurich, so the Institute of Shooting Wang and Thomas Burger, and third of the Institute for Electronics, also of ETH Zurich, and the Institute being headed by Gerhard Tröster. Um, MRI, Magnetic Resonance Imaging, is nowadays an essential tool in medical diagnostics. Essentially every hospital has uh, an MR scanner, and is often one of the first uh, tests uh, being done on patients. It's not just a clinical machine, but it's also often used in research, not just clinical research, but also neuroscience. And um, people who do functional MRI um, are using MR systems actually to look into uh, neurofunction. Well, the market is about 10 billion US dollars nowadays, and there are three big players, Siemens, Philips, and General Electric. And, uh, well, very soon, nobody knows exactly when, Samsung will jump in and hopefully, well, change this market a little bit. In the past 10 years, array detectors have revolutionized MR in the sense that they brought in sensitivity. And the sensitivity is the best currency in MRI, because MRI is inherently of extremely low sensitivity. But having sensors, sensor arrays nearby the body, um, sensitivity has been increased to a degree that MR imaging could be sped up a lot. Now, implementation is of the sort you can see here. This is a typical um, array detector. It's fixed size and shape, so it doesn't really adjust to the patient. The patient comes with different size and, and grafts have different um, diameters. It's a, a very rigid setup, so people are locked in rather than wear such a coil. Um, the cabling is bulky and complex, so feeding out, say, 8 or 16 or 32 RF coaxial cables, which means a lot of coupling to the other structures of the MR system. And at the end of the day, a lot of bulky electronics around the coil, which often reduces patient comfort, as we see in this case. This is a 96-channel head coil. It's called the best MR head receiver of the world. It's a system by Larry Wall in, at MGH in Boston. And you see that although performance-wise this is a beautiful coil, of course this is, well, is not useful in a, in a clinical setting. And this is how this project was actually motivated, and that's why um, the three teams set up to change that and to go for what they call wearable MRI. So rather than having an array detector which locks in your patient or a part of it, you should go to design where people can go and just put a coil on themselves as they would put on a pyjama, say. Now, these coils will be flexible and elastic, so they will adapt to the anatomy, which makes it more practical to wear, but also more efficient in terms of, of filling factor and uh, signal-to-noise ratio. They will have an integrated um, receiver on the coil, which means that there's uh, no cable losses, and which also means that there's no um, coaxial cables feeding out of the MR scanners, given that the signal transmission is optically. 
and also the power supply is optically since then when you replace all um, all cablings by optical transmissions then it'll be transparent for the rest of the MR system at the end of the day having such a wearable MR coil available it well allows for scalability of channels now we can go to 96 channels for example without building a huge coil uh, we can increase the sensitivity that is we get hard currency for MR being able to speed up scans even more we also allow for freedom of motion because often in an MR scan a doctor would like to know um, an anatomical image not just in one position say of an elbow but in several different positions that's true for knees, elbows and, and many other joints as well it's more ergonomic and patient comfort is increased and also given that many well, cables are re replaced by optical links this increase increases safety. What does the project encompass? Well, first of all, it's about building a coil, a coil that is flexible and matching the body. Um, after this coil, of course, we need some electronics since we need to, to match and tune the coil to get best performance out of it. Then having, having um, well, the coil tuned and matched the signal will be um, digitized in an ASIC built by the Institute for um, Integrated Systems and then this digital signal is sent out of the scanner by an, well, by an optical link and this optical link has to be broadband enough to actually be a, being able to transport 32 channels of um, 1 megahertz 22-bit uh, complex samples out of it. All signal processing image reconstruction will be performed outside the bore, um, so at the console where the radiologists will look at the signals. And this entire chain brings um, a number of key challenges with it that should be solved in this project. Variable and sensitive detector coils, an integrated receiver circuit allowing for high SNR and also high dynamic range. This system should work in a very harsh electromagnetic environment. This is a 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla background field. We've got um, acoustic, acoustic frequency fields of, of several tens of kilowatts. We've got RF fields of um, well, several kilowatts as well. Then there are extreme clocking, clocking requirements. Um, and also power requirements in the sense that every channel should uh, well, run on way less than one watt. And finally, uh, the last challenge, challenge is to bring this into medical application. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, the uh, speakers, for the clear presentation and keeping time. The subject here don't even try to do it is to summarize it up in one big uh, uh, shell but it appears to me that uh, let me just start with the technical question uh, I think this has to do with more than more not more more um, it's the platforms we're talking about uh, let me start with the ultrasonics but the question goes to all the people that do the um, that do these uh, electronic platforms is uh, we've spoken a lot about the hardware software issues now a little provocative question this has been around for a long time and uh, did we make significant progress or is it si uh, simply the fact that it's the details that matter to come at the end of the day I think it's energy efficient signal processing is that correct I think it's more complex than that. Clearly, the ultrasound to go, it's a Terra project, and where the parallel processing plays a major role. Uh, the, one of the major issues in this project is how to construct safe software by composing components that have provable properties. Again, people have been working on this domain for years, but I think still we have not to the point in which we have a mature technology to yes. build up soft, 
uh, robust uh, software system. So again, this is placed in, uh, you know, in the uh, more Moore domain, specifically, and there's a strong component on software. But there is, a, to add dimension to that, there is also a more uh, transversal component, because in ultrasound you go from analog to digital to software, and making this path smooth, of course, again, means solving signal processing problem in a diversified environment. So I agree on that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on, on that a little provocative, intentionally provocative statement? I also heard some numbers like uh, uh, with the energy harvesting from around one milliwatt. And uh, that, if the, that's a very understandable limitation. Uh, the additional question would be how many, say, operation data operations can you do with these milliwatts that defines the complexity of your algorithm? Yeah. Uh, it depends also on the energy scavengers that you will use. Uh, if there will be some uh, solar panels, it will be a little bit more. But if you are in favorable conditions, and if you are not in favorable conditions, for example, for solar cells, you will use the, the other systems. Mm -hmm. so that means giving one milliwatt. And in this case, it's possible to adapt also the software that you are using in order to compute your, 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 your data eh, coming mm -hmm. from EEG. And for example, in order to, to compress more or less, to add crypto, cryptography in order to ensure privacy and su such kind of things. Eh. And it's, it's a combination between the nano and the software, the, the, the Terra part. Eh. And for the for the why, uh, uh, I was visiting for the first time the Kinderspital, and I was understanding why they need something like a zero power uh, system because they was having a, they, they they have a room for a child uh, with a bed, and they, 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 the child is going on the bed, and they install all uh, the electrodes 128, and there are a lot of cables. And then there is a control room just beside with a glass, uh, glass semi-transparent. And they are trying, uh, they, they are waiting, and after three hours, no seizure for the, for this, for the child. So all, the, all this equipment is not always useful. And it's the reason why they ask to have a, a body powered system. Yes. Thank you very much. I like to involve now the audience. I'm sure there are questions to the speakers, please. Please. You can imagine that I'm interested to your way to scavenge the energy. And uh, I have a question. So you mentioned different source of energy you want to scavenge and uh, you spoke about the energy you can extract. Which is uh, your target in terms of efficiency uh, that you want to reach in this scavenging process? Because, uh, you know, how close you are to the 100% of taking the energy, this energy and feeding it to your devices? I have not yet uh, figured that there. But for, uh, for example, for, uh, for you, you speak also for solar, solar cells, as you know, Currently, it's uh, how my colleague Christophe Baif will explain a little bit more on the, on the efficiency. But uh, effectively, for the kinetic or so the, the piezo electric system, the, the efficiency is not very high. But we are working on this kind of uh, the doctoral student is working on new structure for uh, poly polymer uh, stretchable systems having five layers and including nano composite generating uh, part inside. Uh, and it's why we're why expecting parts much better result. But I, I cannot give you figures there. You are also addressing uh, different way to store the energy to, to cope with the little power you have available, because what you mentioned in software is very good. Uh, in the case, you can store the energy and that and just activate when you have enough energy to to make uh, your uh, operation that you have to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, uh, okay. You know, I I am coming also from the Swiss watch industry, eh? 
and the difference with the mobile phone industry that the autonomy for a watch is three years. And for my mobile phone, it's three days. Uh, something like that. And yeah, yeah. If you are lucky. I'm going to buy this one. <laughs> and our, our goal is to say, okay, we have to find a way to store also the energy and to do this, all the, the computation the most simple as possible. That means, and, and that means for storage, we use from time to time uh, also SuperCAP or also some, uh, some lithium ion or also all uh, rechargeable batteries. Just to follow up on, on this question of uh, energy, uh, most of the applications you showed are uh, things that people wear and they're gonna take them off uh, maybe after a day or so. These are not things that people are gonna keep on for days on without changing. Uh, one of the questions uh, is um, about scavengers is why not just use batteries? Batteries these days, you know, a coin cell battery can take you a long way for a full day. Uh, and then you can just change it or recharge it. Yeah, yes, you, you know, I think the, this, it's the general idea of the project, eh? also to, to, to try to develop new, new kind of scavenging, eh? As new, new systems. But I, what we think that very often with, with the Internet of Things, when you will have uh, wearable systems, you will have hundreds of systems and your batteries will always, one of or a certain per percentage of your system will have the battery uh, end of life, huh? at the end of life. So if you have a scavenging system, when you are using the system and with a small, small uh, rechargeable battery according to them, it will be more favorable to use them or, or to, ha to have less uh, a case or where you can use your, your, your device. Huh? It's the way developing this, this project. So I was impressed by the target with the MRI system and uh, really it's fantastic if you can achieve uh, what uh, you show. Do you, do you think with this uh, wearable system you will have the same precision that today we have with those giant machine that uh, where we are forced to go inside to have an MRI? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the goal. Uh, we actually do this to increase sensitivity even more. We want to go to more channels. We want to have coils with, say, a hundred arrays with a hundred coils. Having more coils will increase the sensitivity. And we cannot afford on giving away um, SNR by having say, a poor um, digitization in, in place. So the goal is, is to be as, as good as a conventional MR receiver outside the field would perform. Congratulations, impressive. Thank you very much. One or two last questions, because I want to take, stay in time, please. So I didn't fully understand. So in the MIS system, you still need to produce one point five Tesla or something like this, how easily can you do it? Will this make the overall system still rather complex and large? So we're not talking of an MR system without the main magnet. The main magnet will be present as well as the, the gradient system, which is used to encode the images. Um, even, even an RF system will be present. What we are changing is actually the receive part of the MR system. So we'll change the the arrays that are now kind of these fixed large arrays with arrays that are, well, flexible, wearable, and having a, an optical trans, well, an optical line towards the outside. So in terms of overall price, what's the potential? In terms of price reduction relative to the, the old system? Yeah. Well, you always want to increase the price, don't you? <laughs> okay, that's a good point. One last question with Mira. I think the semiconductor industry would be happy to follow this rule. Well, appears question, to me it doesn't work. The question perhaps uh, reaches beyond the panel, and that is uh, what kind of regulatory hurdles you 
would have to overcome to commercialize almost all these platforms. Right? There is a special certification and there's a body here in Switzerland that is required for wearable MRI and other devices. Of course, it's, it's a medical device, an, an MR system, and um, you need medical device certification. Although one needs to say that for, for coils, receive coils alone, uh, this is a relative standard process nowadays because MR manufacturers have many different um, suppliers of MR coils and they have standard tests, um, which means that only the coil itself needs to be um, approved and not the entire MR system again and again if you just change the coil. Do you want to know it from all the technology? Or? Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, in our case, the invention was done here in Switzerland, so the, all our industrial collaborators are here in Switzerland, so I think there's no nothing stopping if there is, if we achieve all our goals and there is this application for which I'm pretty positive that there is a market initially for those applications because we're replacing more complicated laser systems. Uh, for the body boards and systems, I think that there is already two companies involved for the software part for the physicians. So they have to introduce themselves uh, if there is a product interesting for a medical platform. And for the, for the other part, including the integrated circuit or, or the sensing element, the energy harvesting system, if you, we have some companies, I think, in Switzerland that may be interesting in case of success of uh, this, this development. So. So concerning the Patlisi, we, we have already a, a partner on board and the single probe basically is already uh, on the way to be commercialized. If you can do it with a, a race, that's still to show, but I think in principle it should be feasible. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank the uh, speakers for their excellent presentation, lively discussion, and the audience for their particip participation in the discussion. Okay, it's coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.